I'm Allison Rogers. I'll be your host for this session. I'll kind of be sitting back actually letting these two uh, talk off of each other. They're the experts here. Uh, they deal with, uh, they're in the body shops every single day. They do training. They witness everything that's happening in the industry on the ground level. So uh, before we get started here, I'll just give you kind of an agenda. So for the next 40 to 45 minutes, we'll be talking with Brad and John. And then at the end of the session, there'll be a Q and A. If you have any questions that pop up throughout the discussion, feel free to throw them in the chat. We'll get to them eventually, or if it's really relevant at the moment, we might get to it then. More of a laid back session today, but um, let's get into it. So basically we're gonna be talking about full throttle today. We had a session back at the end of last year with Axel Nobel, with Brad and John, where they discussed just everything that's been brought on by the, brought, been brought on by the pandemic, uh, parts shortages, everything that we're dealing with in the industry right now and how we can really get ahead of it with strategies and ways that we can look at things. So before we get into the topics, I'll let Brad and John do a little introductory of themselves each. So let's start with Brad. Why don't you tell us a little bit of your experience with Axel Nobel and uh, in the industry and kind of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. All right. Um, I've been with Axel Nobel 20, I think 27 years now. Uh, started in a trade in early, late 1970s with Randy King Paint and Auto. So I've been, been in the trade for quite a while, for four, over 42 years now. Um, been with Sickens the whole time, sprayed Sickens in several, in a few shops in Calgary. I shouldn't say several, sounds bad, but in, in a few shops in Calgary. And uh, yeah, so now I'm started as a TC at, with Axel Nobel. And last two years, I've been the technical manager for Axel Nobel in Canada. That's so a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of experience there, Brad. Uh, you've, uh, you mm -hmm. know, Sickens through and through, clearly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, John, I know as well, you've uh, got a long background in the industry as well. So tell us about your uh, history with Axon Nobel in the collision repair sector. And whenever Brad says he started in the 70s, I'm like, those Rhino King boys getting him working when he was eight years old. That's a bit young to get going, eh, Brad? The, um, but uh, no, I've been in the industry quite a while as well. I kind of like to tell this story just because there's so much potential for this industry and in trying to get young people into it. I mean, I, I fell into this industry. I was you know, taking a break from school, a buddy I played hockey with, he just said, Hey, we need some help actually tearing down a paint booth and building a new one. Why don't you come in and help us out? We were trying to figure this out. And here we are 30 years later, I ended up spending 10 years in that body shop, um, ended up being a ticketed technician, ticketed painter. Um, but all the while being very fascinated with this, um, ACO program that, that the owner and the, the manager particularly weighed, he would go to these meetings and come back with some very, very, what I thought were very cool ideas. Uh, so gravitated to this program um, a long time ago. And now I've been fortunate enough to be uh, directly in the program as a sales guy. I used to attend as much as possible um, and then became a services consultant within, within Axon Bell's ACO program. And for the past couple of years have been managing the ACO team. So Within ACO, we work with shops one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's just a shoulder to lean on, working on pay plans, profitability, industry trends, just really anything a shop uh, wants help with, we do that one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we facilitate classes, whether that's in person, we were doing some virtual ones. <clears throat> we'll do it on site at a shop. We'll do it uh, with a bunch of shops together at a location. Uh, and then we also facilitate performance groups, and that's kind of at the core of what we do. Uh, we just had a great session last week hosted by Joe and Janet Precision in Saskatoon. We did a, it's sort of, it's our national group, it's our legacy group, some very, very progressive, um, impressive operators in that group, which generates lots of lively discussion. We got great groups across the country, and it's great to be back in person doing these. Um, you know, everybody was really happy to, to see each other and, you know, build great friendships and at the same time share common struggles. Um, so that performance group environment's a big, big part of what we do within ACO. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I hear a lot of things coming out of that performance group, just of how valuable it is. And we all know how important it is to stay connected in this industry. We're a very tight knit industry and uh, we deal with a lot of the same issues. So sharing yeah. strategies and whatnot, um, kind of like we're doing today. <laughs> yeah. So both of you have a lot of experience speaking to shops on a daily basis, advising them um, of things. So our main idea of kind of what we're speaking about today is, do you have a plan? We're asking these shops, do they have a plan? So um, John, Brad, take it away. What do you think shops should be looking at plan-wise and considering plans in areas? Well, I mean, that's a very, it's an interesting question. And, you know, even last week, we've got some very, it's, it's more challenging than ever right now. 
Um, so flying blind, flying without a plan, um, it is an option, but it's an option that's going to get you into a lot of trouble. Um, so whatever that plan is, is it, is it volume returning? Is it, you know, trying to, I mean, the biggest complaint, not complaint, the biggest challenge that we hear from people is how do we attract people to this industry and how do we process vehicles with the supply chain issues? Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, a third big challenge is, you know, downward pressure on profitability. How do we remain? And I know we're going to get to that, but those are kind of the big three right now that we're hearing. And, you know, what is your plan? How often do you, um, sit down? Because another thing that's very common in the industry, I mean, everyone's trying to do more with less. So we have managers, owner operators that are just swamped with, uh, the whirlwind, so to speak. And you've got all the best intentions. Um, you've got maybe a plan that you know you need to work on, but there's just so much noise pulling you away from that. And, you know, what, what we talk about is just how critical it is to separate yourself from your business and sit down and devise a plan. And don't devise a plan by yourself. Engage your key people. Speak to your peers in the industry. Speak to, you know, there's lots of, there, there's your network, there's your distributor, there's your paint company. There's, there's, there's a lot of entities out there that can help you uh, with your plan, but you have to have a plan. Um, and, and then that plan needs to be, you know, looked at on a regular basis. Is it working? What do I need to change? Who do I need to include? And your key people in your organization are so critical uh, to, to, because if you have a plan and no one else is on board, then it's, it's, it's not much of a plan. So yeah, at the end of the day, what, you know, how are you going to get buy-in from your people and how are you going to hold people accountable and how are you going to know if your plan's working or not? When you say plan to, and all of these different things we're dealing with, I know you said you have a plan to be profitable. Do you have a plan on how to address new volume returning? There's so many different areas where we can address these plans. When you say plan, do you mean small plans to address each issue or an overarching plan to kind of get yourself back on track? What does it look like? That's a great question. I mean, it's more instead of a you know a better way to put it, maybe what's your strategy? What's mm -hmm. your overarching strategy of what you're trying to achieve as an organization? And within that, you will have different plans to to address the different issues, which is the most critical. And we we kind of break it into, and for for anyone on the call that was involved in our meeting last week, you know, we talked about this is what there's the big difference between strategy and tactics. One without the other fails. So you can have the best strategy in the world, but if you don't have tangible tactics to achieve that strategy, it's, 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 it's gonna struggle, it's gonna limp. And then if you've got all these best tactics, you've got all these you know, different ways you're achieving the minutia, so to speak, what's, what are you trying to accomplish? Is it working, is it not? Um, are we taking steps forward? Are we taking steps backwards? So you know, perhaps a better way to put it is what's your strategy? What, what, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to, is it people focused? Is it profit focused? It, it can be both. Um, mm -hmm. But how are you addressing those issues? Mm -hmm. And those tactics are like you're saying, when you speak to your suppliers, your partners in the industry and people that are doing the same thing, that's the tactics you can kind of take from there. And yeah. And, and, and you know, a plan to, I mean, with a, I mean, one way to look at it is, you know, with the uh, the, 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 the pressure on profitability, the downward pressure on profitability. Um, are you going to react to that by trying to increase volume? So what does that mean? You need people to increase volume. Uh, you need capacity, you need square footage, you need equipment, you need relationships, you need certificate. There's a lot of things you need um, to go after volume. Or if you want to decide, you know what, I'm not going to chase volume. I'm going to maximize, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to plan to a number that I'm comfortable with, and I'm going to try to maximize profitability within that sales number. So two very, very different approaches to your business, but both require very different strategy and a very different tactics. Mm -hmm. Very personable too. It de depends on who you are and how you want to approach Bingo. things. Very yeah. different. Um, so you're speaking of this downward pressure on profit and Brad, I, the su supply chain situation is tense and it has been for a while. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding the control of material consumption in the body shop just in times like these? How can people kind of control or find tactics like Brad's saying here to um, really handle that issue? It's a difficult one now. And I, I mean, the parts shortage and the difficulty to getting parts affects their material 
usage and profit as well too because i mean you get normally everybody likes to paint a car once get it done and get it back together and or now we have the issue of well let's paint what we can then when the rest of the parts come in we'll we'll finish the car off which is a cost on labor cost on material it's a challenging very challenging time for the shops right now and it's just a matter i guess it's just a matter of the best way to organize that and mm -hmm. putting things prioritizing i guess the right jobs and knowing exactly how much you need yeah. i mean measuring systems yeah. too, making sure yeah, that, i mean measure you know yeah keep track of your materials mix what you need don't over mix don't you know naturally if i always if you got a young young technician just starting in the business that's where you want to watch you know keep an eye on it and i always suggest to them to mix enough for the first coat mix enough even if it is a little less sooner or later they'll figure out and a system and mix what they need rather than i think i'll need three liters so i'll mix four so i don't run out that's yeah, yeah pretty bad tactic right but if you have someone in the shop that maybe like operates on a principle like that, how do you kind of knock that out of your mind? Cause you kind of took the words in my mind. Well, I was going to say something with training next. Like uh, if you have somebody that operates on a principle like that and knocking that out of their mind or training your staff to use the proper amount of materials, what are the tactics there? There's different tactics. I mean, one of the tactics I've used in the past and some of my colleagues have used in the past is just letting the technicians know just how much this stuff costs. Yeah. <laughs> Making them, them aware, actual bill. <laughs> making, making them aware of the cost. You know, I mean, a lot of them don't have a clue. They don't have any idea what it costs. I mean, especially some of the younger people coming to the trade, they might think it's the same as what they see at Home Depot. Paint's paint, right? But if we show them exactly what it costs, and this is this is why we want to minimize the usage to get the job done once and get it done, get it done the first time rather than remixing, mixing too much, minimize the waste as much as possible yeah and so that's one of the things we we have in the past i have taken you know containers and set it above the scale with pricing on there this is how much one liter this is how much half liter costs this is how much one liter cost two liter three liter and you see a lot of eyes open up pretty wide when they see that well being transparent like that can open a lot of doors too i mean you shouldn't be too too transparent like you know showing no. all of your totals there but you know that's something that can like you're saying it's beneficial to uh material waste and what and in times like this you don't want to see some paint in the garbage <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> or over spray all over the place <laughs> we don't want that you don't want to see any waste of any kind really mm -hmm. everybody's got to be a minimalist now i guess these days. <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah we're, we're operating I know, on, uh, I know we do at the grocery store even now too it's getting more and more it's no different yeah dealing with material increase. Body, any materials right so across the board materials have increased it's not just paint folks <laughs> not just parts and everything like that so um and repair planning is an important part of everything too so handing it back to john uh, what have you seen in terms of repair planning in the body shop that's how does that fit into the whole process of you know making sure we're not wasting materials and faring through this crisis as best as we can well i mean <clears throat> we're, we're talking about planning out of the gate and and obviously a very effective repair plan we you know, we talk about it a lot. Um, and, and, you know, to Brad's point about, you know, minimizing redos, you know, related to repair planning, minimizing supplements. I mean, we have enough issues just trying to get parts that are going to cause, you know, delays and, you know, getting vehicles through that we didn't use to face. So why not, you know, we don't want to add to that by creating our own challenges with missing parts. So, mm -hmm. you know, a complete repair plan is going to, you know, help you, you know, you're going to be waiting for those parts, but if you start finding stuff further down the line and then you got to wait for those parts, you've just extended, you know, you, you've compounded a problem. Um, so, so again, it's a plan and, you know, to, to whether it's material related, whether it's parts related, whether it's labor operations related, we need to capture it all. Um, and to capture it all, you need attention to detail, um, you, you know, downward pressure on profitability. We've already talked about, we have to capture everything we're entitled to in that repair plan. And if that means, you know, your estimators written a sheet, now you have to engage some of your technicians on, you know, what they see, that could be a judgment time, that could be a labor operation that was missed. The more eyes you get on that, you know, the, the more, the less likely you are to, to miss something that's going to cost you a delay down the road. 
and you know, to Brad's point, a redo costs you not only material um, waste, but time waste because you well, you're redoing that vehicle. Obviously, you're not generating revenue like you would on a job that you're not redoing that you are being compensated for. Um, plus, it's, it's extending a, a, a time to complete a vehicle that you know. I think customers' expectations are such now that they understand the supply chain issue. But again, communication, let's communicate that outwardly. You know, don't, don't tell a customer when you feel their, their, their vehicle is going to be potentially ready until it's repair planned. And then if you've got a very, very uh, defined attention to detail repair planning process, you can be relatively confident coming out of that. But you're, you know, now with, with parts issues, people used to communicate uh, delivery dates to expectation dates to a customer post repair plan. You can't even do that now. You need to wait until you have confirmation of parts, parts receipt. They're in your shop. Now you can communicate a um, expected delivery date because you have everything. And, you know, the repair plan is kind of at the core of that. Mm -hmm. And and whether, again, back to Brad's point about materials is you know, get the painters involved in your repair plan, get them starting to identify colors out of the gate, not when the car's in the booth, not when the car's about to go in the booth. You know, they can take a camera shot in repair plan, start to, you know, build the color, look at their library, know if it's going to be an issue or not. And if it's going to be an issue, tackle it sooner than later. Um, again, how it's all related back to touch time pressures, cycle time pressures, you know, you got to, and, and it all sort of bundles up into a plan. What, what is your plan? Mm -hmm. um, and then how is everybody going to fit into that? So the repair plan, to my point, is critical. Mm -hmm. So from that point as well, you're talking about, sorry, we got a question here from Daryl O'Keefe threw me off here. So we'll, uh, <laughs> Daryl O'Keefe's asking, AXO and Nabel has a global footprint. As such, have you seen global trends coming our way that may impact us in, like, in the future? Um, perhaps ones that we haven't seen locally yet, uh, whether it's distribution, insure, other changes, anything that you two have noted as of recent? Well, that's interesting because there is trends in Europe that are very different than North America. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the, the network structure is different. There's insurance networks. There's so to see trends that may come here, may not. I mean, it's it's that's a great question. It's really hard to say because they're, you know, they're the the different markets are so different that something that's, you know, taking hold in Europe may never take hold in North America. There's things in the U.S. that may never take hold in Canada, mm -hmm. um, you know. So it's, it, 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 to be honest with you, it's it's tough to say. It's tough to say. But consolidation is one global <laughs> trend that you know the the ingredients for consolidation are. It's the ideal recipe right now in the market for consolidation. Mm -hmm. You know, downward pressures on profitability, which requires volume, and how do you pursue volume through size and what is size consolidation. So, um, you know, that, you know, that's a global trend that is definitely, you know, taking hold across the planet. Mm -hmm. Without putting you too, too much on the spot here, just a question that I'm sure is on a lot of people's minds, just uh, with material increases. Is there any, I, it's hard asking this question because you don't, nobody knows when the bubble is finally going to pop or if it ever will, but do you foresee any sort of relief or something on that front? Well, it's a really, I mean, it's difficult to, to, to it's not difficult to discuss because it's a reality. Um, mm -hmm. Costs go up mm -hmm. and, and, you know, whether that's, you know, your material costs, your paint costs, your labor costs, your parts costs, it is. Your grocery is like an Brad was saying. <laughs> it's an inflationary um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, world out there right now, more now than ever. And the challenging thing in our industry is every other industry that's not driven by insurance the end user ends up paying the increase right the increase gets passed on now in the, in, in this world it, it's it doesn't move as quickly obviously that's the elephant in the room we just it, the prices can't be passed on immediately uh, so for me it, it goes to its communication it's awareness it's this isn't a sustainable model when you have prices going up and compensation not. That's just, it, 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 it's not sustainable at no. the end of the day. Um, so how do, and I'm thinking, 
there's more communication now than ever. ever. Um, there's, oh. Sorry, I think we just had an echo there for a second. Sorry about that. that. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, we are, things need to happen and, and, and insurance companies, you know, there's governmental legislation, they can't just rise their premiums, right? So, so there's so many factors at play here. And I think at the end of the day, as an industry, I know it may seem like Shangri-La, but we need to communicate more and understand everybody's wants and needs a little more. Um, and for, a, for someone who owns a body shop to remain, um, to, to be sustainable, uh, there needs to be compensation for rising costs. There just has to be. Um, and, but we don't through, the, we don't, it's not going to get achieved through complaining and pounding fists on the table. It has to be communication and all parties willing to work with each other. Because if there's no, <laughs> if there's no shops to fix cars, then, you know, that's a whole nother problem. Yeah, that's a big and problem. if something's not sustainable, that, you know, that's the direction it goes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that again goes to attracting people into the trade. If we're not, if they're not able to get a, a living wage to come into the trade because of profitability being down and because of costs going up, you're not going to get the right people mm -hmm. into this trade. So. Yeah. It's so many moving parts, as you're saying, John, there, and then Brad adding to that point. I mean, there's so many other parts we could address here and sit all day, but we've got another question and then we'll get back on track to our regular conversation. But I'm Megan sorry. McEwen, um, she's a painter out in BC. Uh, she says, some businesses have a material deduction from their painters' wages. Would a production plan plus cost transparency perhaps eliminate excessive material waste? Um, Interesting. Hi, Megan. There. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, a cost, a, you say a reduction in wage for- Yeah, material? material deduction from their painter's wages. So if I guess if they use extra materials, I'm assuming they're deducting those from your wages, Megan? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't, uh, I mean, actually my, my more ex experience is a bonus for if you save materials and if, you, if the profitability is going up rather than a punishment and a reward. So mm -hmm, that's yeah i think that would from at least personally i think that would be more of a beneficial yeah, for anyone yeah uh, yeah more it's, it's a little better incentive than i i would think right and taking your money <laughs> i would agree with that too yeah um but yeah we do have lots of material bonuses that we work with shops on and and you know set a benchmark of what you're happy with as a you know you don't you can't incentivize people to be average, but if you if you have a material profitability goal, again, what's your plan? <laughs> um, what's your goal? What's the number? And you set that number, and then any anything that exceeds that number, you share with the people who have a direct say in hitting the number. And it's not just the painter consumption. I mean, it's the estimator writing a sheet, making sure you're compensated uh, for all the operations. So, you know, a pay you can have the most profitable painter on the planet or contributes to your profit you you put that painter in an environment where they're not getting compensated ideally then they're not as profitable as they were in the environment where where compensation was where it had to be and and, and estimating accuracy and consistency and making sure you're you are capturing everything you're entitled to because you know we can't complain about compensation and then not capture everything we're entitled to right like it's you got to at least be capturing everything you're entitled to Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's a key point that people are very keen, uh, very interested to, you know, explore today. Um, but one thing I wanted to pick apart, John, you said uh, in your repair planning um, spiel there, painter prep and painters, perhaps like before the car is even in their bay or it's days away from being in their bay, checking out the codes, seeing if there's any problems that might arise. A lot of shops, at least that I speak to, the high volume shops would argue that they don't have time to do something like that. So how do you implement the or teacher text, like you do have to make time for this. Like it will save you time down the road. You know who says they don't have time? People without a plan. Say there you go. <laughs> but I know it's easy for me to say, right? I'm not knee deep like, like all the owners on the call are and, and all the technicians on the call are. But again, it goes back to, you know, you efficiency creates time. Mm -hmm. Inefficiency eats time. So we really need to, I mean, setting yourself up early. I mean, I was just in a, you know, uh, precision in Saskatoon where, you know, they hosted, we did a tour of the facility and, you know, as I'm in the back, I'd see all these post-it notes on this board beside the mixing computer. 
and I could see paint codes on there. And so I just, you know, when the painter had a sec, I said, Hey, can you, what are you doing here? Like, well, what do you got going here? And, and that was exactly it in repair planning. He'll go over, he'll document the, the, the paint code. Um, then he'll go back to his library, see if he's got that color sprayed. If he does, he'll go take it out to the car. Okay. That's no problem. I've already got that color matched. Um, if, if he doesn't, then he'll do a camera shot. And then now he's got time. And then he's got a post it there reminding him this car's coming, this paint code's coming. And I need to figure this out before it's sitting ready to go in the booth. Right. So that's a plan. He had a plan. And, and he fights very few challenges and, and, and it's a shop with a very, um, very, very impressive cycle time. They, they produce vehicles. They have a plan. I think and a lot of not people... just the owners have a plan. Here's a painter. Exactly. He's not, he's not complaining about colors and this and that. He, he set himself up to, to be efficient. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think a lot of people might be getting in their heads, perhaps not on this webinar, but when they hear the word plan, they're like, a plan for everything that's a lot like we were saying a strategy at the beginning but it's down to that like your painter can just come up with a plan on themselves sometimes yeah. you don't have to do anything you just have good staff that will be able to you know see these issues and tackle them themselves yeah. it's contagious when you have a plan and you're constantly planning it becomes contagious and then your employees start to plan right mm -hmm. and that's when you start to win when they're when they're playing the game and it's you know it's uh, back to you know to talk about planning again um you know, I got a colleague, Bob Gilbert in the US who first showed me this analogy and it's so, so uh, accurate is we too often put, like you think about building a jigsaw puzzle. We throw all the puzzle pieces out for our people and we say, build the puzzle. And, you know, they just are floundering. They're grabbing pieces, looking for blue, looking for edges, looking for orange, mm -hmm. but we don't give them the box cover. Yes. Like, let's give them the box cover. This is what we're trying to build. Let's build it. So then then they start working together. Oh, you're working on blue pieces here. Here's the blue. Oh, you're doing the edges. Here's all the edge pieces. And then you get your people working together and that the plan just becomes contagious. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree with that one. I see my coworkers making plans. I just want to make plans too. It's, it's <laughs> absolutely a great way to put it. Um, Brad, well, well, Tom Bissonette's got a question in the comments, but we will. Uh, oh, and Daryl's got another question. We've got people asking questions over here. We will get to them, I promise. But I want to give Brad a chance to speak now. Um, and we're talking about repair planning and you mentioned rework previously. How much of rework rests on having a proper repair plan? Do you, if you have a proper repair plan, is the potential for rework completely gone or what's the, what do you see it as? I, I, I mean, rework can happen at any stage of the repair. I mean, you have internal re, rework, you can have, uh, so the, planning the repair, planning your blend panels, planning where, where you're going to blend, do you need to blend, that kind of thing is, is critical. And doing that early so you don't have to run over and grab a body mat or take some parts off the car later on in the process. Or, you know, like John says, getting a color in repair plan can help you with a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Do I need to, do I have a color like the painter of precision? He already has a color, he knows what he needs to do. So it's going to save a lot of guesswork long before the car gets there to the paint booth. When you walk into a facility that maybe tells you we're having some issues with rework, it seems like every job we have to go back and do something or reblend something. What's your first thing? What do you really say to them and or question you ask them to figure out what's going on? Well, I'd like to see the job from start to finish, like find out what happened to it from start mm -hmm. to finish, what, what the plan was before it got there. Did they? I mean, one of the biggest reworks I see in a shop is one of them is repriming doing body work, putting primer on a vehicle more than once, which is probably one of the biggest, a huge cost for them as well. The other one is not having a plan on the color. The car gets to the booth. And nowadays there's so many specialty colors, special effect toners. There's toners you may not have in your shop. Um, now we got to order it. So we're either backing that car out of the booth and then bringing another one in. We're slowing down production. That's good. That's a huge cost. Mm -hmm. And you may have, you know, you may have something mixed up already for this job and now you can't finish it mm -hmm. because of poor planning. Again, right? there's that word again. <laughs> plan, plan, plan. Sorry, we're drilling this into your head. You guys are going to be dreaming about the word plan tonight. Some big one, thing, one important, this came up at our, at our meeting too, and it, it, it comes up all the time is as much as we're talking about planning, we can fall into the trap of perpetual planning. There are perpetual planners out there that always plan, always plan, never execute. So 
a critical part of planning is executing that plan. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we, we, you know, I use the analogy, it's like practicing, 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 let's play the freaking game, right? Like <laughs> the game's the fun part. Practicing is not as fun as a game. Let's play just like a plan. Let's execute. And how do you know if that plan's working? Another, you know, effective strategy or just a quick acronym is that, you know, PDCA, so the plan, do, check, act cycle should be lived by everybody when they're planning and executing. So, you know, the P is plan, the D is do. So you plan something, then you do it. You play the game. You don't just keep practicing. And then what's a scoreboard in a game? It tells you how you're doing. Do you need to change tactics? So the check, plan, do, check. So now I'm going to check. How do I check? I check with data. I check with input from employees, input from stakeholders, input from partners. Is the plan working? If it's not working, you act. You need to change the plan. And then it never stops. There's no finish line. It's, it goes forever. You plan, you do, you check, you act. And that cycle should, in successful entities, whether it's a body shop or a global corporation, um, that, that concept is embedded in their in their strategy. Mm -hmm. Don't give up on your plan because of one failure. I see that too often too. That's mm -hmm. where you want to bring the team in. And like John says, play the game. Don't give up on your plan because of one failure. Bring the team together and let's discuss how we can move that failure from happening again. Fix it. Yeah. Develop, develop the plan. Improve it. Even with the plan, do, act, check, cycle, some people might still get stuck in the top step plan. So, I mean, there's no, we can't say like spend three days planning and then figure it out. It's more of an observe the situation and then do that. But is there a rough timeline that you shouldn't be spending X amount of time on this plan before you actually execute it or any practices that you see there? That it's hard because be, it depends on person. <laughs> it depends on the, the size of what you're trying to accomplish. Exactly, but yeah. rather than putting a time frame on it, I would just say there needs to be time you need to schedule time for it you you because you know again you go to a conference you go to a performance group meeting you do something like that you come back you're all excited there's something you're going to do and then whap you get punched in the throat from the the whirlwind so to speak mm -hmm. um and 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 now all of a sudden you're you're trying to you you're just caught in the whirlwind so you don't it, back to the painter not having time the the owner not having time um, and, and that's because you're getting pulled in a million directions. So schedule it, whether it's eight in the morning on a Monday, whether it's eight in the morning on a Friday, on a Wednesday, noon, whatever it is, doors closed, I'm not here. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, the, you got to, you got to devote time to it. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's a specific situation that you're tackling, something happened, God forbid, and it's a one-time situation. You never want that to happen again. You got to tackle it right away. You got to, like you're saying, make time schedule, make yeah. sure it doesn't happen again. Or if you know that one thing that you're working on that you feel is going to have the biggest impact on your business, whether it's through throughput, whether it's through profitability, whatever it is, that one thing you've identified that you know that you feel is going to have the biggest impact, you need to set aside time to, to give it a fighting chance and hold people accountable. Um, and then check to see maybe, maybe you nailed it and you're like, I'm still not making any more money okay, well, if that wasn't it, time to change the plan um, and, and try something else until you start seeing the traction, seeing the results, you know, then, then, then you just continue to execute and hold people accountable to make sure that it's, it's still going and it doesn't die on the vine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Still got some questions coming in, but we're almost to the end of our chat here. So I'll just save it for the last, uh, the last 20 minutes or so. So keep the questions coming guys. Uh, but in today's day and age, we, we're collecting so much data in the collision center. There's so much information data circulating around, but do many collision centers actually know what to do with this data or how to leverage it from your experience? Whew, that's again, that's a, it is a big question. <laughs> well, it's a topic that comes up a lot because we mm -hmm. are bombarded with data. Um, we, we, we are continually bombarded, whether it's through our management system, through our insurance KPIs, through, you know, other software that we've installed, you know, our, our accounting, like everything, there's data, but you have to not drown in it. You have to find out what you need and utilize that because without it, you're flying blind. So we need it, but we also don't need to drown in it. 
and and we just need to figure out what gives us the best picture, the best snapshot, what what give us gives us the cleanest because it's a scoreboard. Data is a scoreboard. Are we winning or losing? Is this working or not? Am I making money or not? Am I turning cars at the rate I need to? Um, you know, so so don't drown in it. Identify what works for you and lean on it hard. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And in terms of uh, real-time data versus maybe checking your data once a month, uh, what do you think is more beneficial to a person? Should they be checking data daily or on a weekly basis, monthly, in terms of cycle times and KPIs, other things that are important? Well, there's going to be a lot of, you know, there's some things you, you are going to want to have your, your eye on daily. A schedule. Did we adhere to our schedule today? Um, you don't want to look at the end of a month. Did we adhere to our schedule this month? Because it's, it, if, if it started limping on the second, you just right. had 28 days of limping when you could have fixed it in real time. So, you know, you're going to be looking at things like that, but you know, your P and L you're going to look at the end of the month. Um, exactly. You know, your technician efficiencies, how were they this month? You know, uh, another one you might look at daily is your whip. I mean, it's funny, we call this uh, discussion return to full throttle, but you know, based on a lot of people I'm talking to, it's not full throttle, it's high speed wobble, right? Yeah. Like people are just, <laughs> cruising faster than they can mm -hmm. um, and high speed wobbles kicking in. So, you know, how do we control whip? I mean, what's the biggest contributor to high speed wobble? It's an out of control whip. Mm -hmm. And with, with all the supply chain issues, that's a very real challenge. Um, you know, tow, tow ins do not stop coming. What do you do with them? You schedule them in. How do I, how do I, you know, my optimal whip might look a little different today than it did in 2019. Mm -hmm. but we're still managing to something. We can't just manage to chaos. We have to, we have to manage to something. Um, and, and whip is a big, big part of that. You know, what is my optimal whip? How much bigger is it now than it used to be? Do I manage to it? That's something you're going to have your eye on, not on, not daily, but constantly have mm -hmm. your eye on that whip. You know, are we getting leaner? Or are we getting bigger? Um, so it's, you know, then there's, there, 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 we actually have a, I mean, I wouldn't go through it right now, but we actually have a recommended, we have a sort of a flow chart of, you know, these are things you should have your eye on daily. These are things you should have your eye on weekly. These are the things you should have your eye on monthly. Mm -hmm. And we distribute that out to our ACO shops. And, you know, it's, it, is it a challenge to do them all? Of course, does everyone tick the boxes every day, every week, every month? Probably not. But at least, again, you, there's a roadmap. There's yeah. some structure to it. Try to try to you know uh, give the chaos some structure, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Alexander Rochelot wants to know what your favorite KPI is. <laughs> My favorite KPI. Um, wow, I would you know uh, it's funny. This again, this came up recently. I don't know if anyone's read the read the book Moneyball or watched the movie Moneyball, baseball movie. Billy Bean sort of the forefather of applying data analytics to baseball. And to your point about so much data in our industry, how do we apply data to our industry? And, you know, I'm not going to go on a tangent about baseball, but they identified as it's not the glamour KPIs. It's not the home runs. It's not the RBIs that lead to wins. What leads to wins? Scoring runs. What leads to scoring runs? The data showed it's getting on base, walking the most boring play in baseball as good as a single, right? It's the same, you get on first base. So, you know, I rack my brain about what's, what is the on-base percentage for our industry? What is that non-glamorous KPI that leads us to scoring runs, producing vehicles in a profitable manner, which ultimately leads to profitable sales? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, I'm still, you know, it, it's hard to put my finger on one because I'm actually, I actively think about it a lot. Um, <laughs> But adherence to a whip to me is a major that, you know, that my, my mind goes there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, how do I maintain um, some semblance of consistency in my facility to produce consistent, consistent results? Mm -hmm. I would agree. I think whip is. When your whip's out of control, we do an exercise with shops, you know, when you have a fat whip, what are all the positives, all the negatives? And it is. Oof, the, the positives are maybe three. You feel yeah. good because you've got all this food in the cupboard, but it's going to go rotten. You can't eat it. 
Mm -hmm. There's a recent convention I was at where one uh, one shop owner mentioned the square footage of their building and everyone was like, oh my gosh, with hard eyes looking at them. Like, I wish I had a building like that. Yeah. But remember, having something that big comes with a lot of challenges as well. Yeah. So um, exactly. Um, all right. So before we wrap things up into our question and answer, I want to talk on leveraging data. And we're speaking about, you know, the WIP is a big part of uh, WIP, work in progress, everything you have in your facility. It depends a lot on your staff and who you have in the body shop producing things. We're in a staff shortage right now, skill shortage, North America. It's, it's widespread across the entire industry. Um, now, Brad, I know that you have a lot of experience dealing with uh, training young people and whatnot. What have you seen in terms of uh, new talent entering the industry? What are people, students thinking right now? I know you mentioned you were at SAIT recently speaking to people. Yeah, um, I mean, I was encouraged. I was at SAIT. They had a pre-employment class, so we were there. I was there um, on this. I can't remember what day. It was their first week there. So, and it's really a great program that SAIT does in Calgary where they have, they bring kids in who've never held a paint gun before in their life and give them an opportunity to touch the trade. And long story short, they, they got the gun in their hands, sprayed some panels and, and did a great job. A lot of interest. Um, I sat down in the classroom with them and just seen what their interest was in the, in the trade, pulled them some good and bad. I was trying to be as honest as I could with about them, about the trade. Um, but there was a lot of interest and, and really going there, I was kind of discouraged about what was coming into the trade, but I, it was very positive with these, these young people. And then they had a lot of interest, asked a ton of questions about the trade. Their biggest challenge is finding it and, and the reputation of the trade. I think it's still, unfortunately, it still has a bad reputation out there of being a dirty, unhealthy trade i heard that too too much so you know i had that was one of the longest conversations i had with them was about health and safety but it's it's really not that bad there are protect protections out there and it's not you don't go home every day covered in six inches of dust i mean that's your choice unless you're going to roll around on the floor in the bondo dust on purpose really um, i'm not so sure how long you'll be taken seriously there but <laughs> <laughs> but but no, it was really encouraging. And some of the work they did, I seen I seen kids who had never held a paint gun in their in their life. They grabbed the instructors at SAIT, got them to spray some fenders, silver metallic. And to be honest with you, they look just as good as some stuff I see in the body shop. So they were really painted for, and it's just one panel. But yeah, it was still. <laughs> but it was, it was nice to see. But the, you know, there were some students that really grabbed grabbed on and oh. asked questions. Where, where do I go from here? I love this. This is, this is fun. Like, the, the hardest part is keeping them interested. They want to go, go, go all the time and learn constantly. So you got to, you got to keep them motivated. Well, there's so many things to learn about in the industry. I mean, every day there's new materials being changed or procedures are being changed. There's so many things for them to learn. And um, in my own experiences, I've dealt with uh, Tropicana Community Center does a program with Centennial College. And it's the same thing as what you're saying, Brad. A lot of these people, I witnessed them do their first glue pull up, dent, pull, dent pulling um, session, and they were all very excited to get the glue on there. And uh, it's great to see because there are, there are people out there that are excited about the industry, even though you do hear about how short we are all the time. So... Um, that, that labor shortage is everywhere, right? Like it's not a it's not a collision industry problem. It's, <clears throat> you know, I was listening to something the other day. They're talking about the, you know, society is producing more or the, con sorry, consuming more than it has the capacity to produce. Everyone's mm -hmm. consuming, consuming. We don't have the people to make it all. Um, so that the labor shortage is everywhere. Um, unemployment's at an all-time low, yet we can't find people. So what does that tell you? Um, so it, it's, it's interesting and it, and it, it's not all negative. I, you know, I've been in several shops recently with lots of young faces in there, which is very, very exciting to see, um, and, and engaged people. And I think, you know, it's, it, you know, I know Brad does a fabulous job getting out into the colleges and working with them. And, you know, even us as a services team, I think it's incumbent upon us to get out there too, just to show, I mean, I'm a technician, I was a technician, um, I chose to, to move on to a different part of the industry, which has led me to where I am now. But if I wasn't a technician or I didn't, you know, you know, say yes to go work in the shop that day, um, I wouldn't be sitting here today. So the, there's so many opportunities within this industry that can provide a very, you know, a, a, a stable um, living. And, and it doesn't mean that it, it, nothing wrong with being a technician until you're retired. A lot of people do that. But 
it can lead to ownership. It can lead to, you know, working for a manufacturer, working for a distributor, working for a collision repair magazine, working for, you know, an insurance company, working for a network. I mean, they're working for a supplier, an OE, like they're just, the opportunities are endless. Um, and I think it's important that we, you know, open people's eyes to the opportunities that this industry provides. And give them and talk to them, give them opportunities, ask them what they want to do when they come to the shop. Ask them, where do you want to go from here? Do you want it? I'm, most of them don't want to stay in the wash bay or sweeping floors for the mm -hmm. rest of their life. I'm sure of it. Yeah. Right. You want to go on a good story. One of the kids had at state who was in the first year was he wasn't getting the opportunity and the painter would always kind of push him away. Didn't want him coming near him. So he took it upon himself to sit down at lunchtime beside the painter one day and say, this is what I want to do. I really want to learn and just had a good, person to person conversation throughout lunch and he said the next day the painter was a different person he was calling me into the booth showing me stuff and wow. it was awesome and he said he just took it upon himself after being in a shop for four months and sweeping floors that, mm -hmm. and he got the opportunity so kudos to the painter as well for yeah, totally. doing that right and if there's anyone watching that's in that position that perhaps wants to jump up to a new role and has someone, a mentor, a possible mentor above them, just talk to them, see what can happen from it. Like John's saying and Brad's saying, there's so many different avenues in collision repair. Mm -hmm. yeah. And see some names in the attendance list here, former technicians that are now running big time companies. So, <laughs> all right. So that actually segues us perfect into our question um, from Tom Bissonnette, director of SAR out in Saskatchewan. Uh, he said, John, you make a good point that the collision industry needs to communicate their situation better to other stakeholders. How or who do you see bringing that message forward? Uh, and just in terms of just the industry and spreading the, the general gospel of collision repair. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's another really good question. And it's, you know, I think, you know, Tom in particular, not to pump his tires too much, but he does a fabulous job in the province of Saskatchewan of creating a healthy relationship between industry and SGI. There's, 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 a, there's a healthy back and forth there. It's constructive. I'm sure sometimes it gets, you know, I'm sure sometimes it probably gets a little uh, adversarial because it by nature, it's, it can be an adversarial um, relationship, but it, it's dealt with respect. I think we have to look at situations through everybody's eyes, um, be, be understanding of, of all the different points of view and create constructive dialogue. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to educate the insurance industry on, you know, the, let's just use the example of special effect colors. There's, you know, the, before, everyone gets compensated for two stage, three stage <clears throat> that, that was created before matte finishes, translucent finishes, um, all these, you know, non-included labor operations that us as a manufacturer tell shops they have to do to replicate a finish. Now, insurance companies don't know anything about that. So when I'm speaking with someone from insurance, I'm not telling them what they should do or need to do. I educate them on this is reality. Us as a manufacturer, this is what we task our customers with to replicate that new finish. Um, the current compensation model does not compensate for it. So what do we do? Um, you know, so it creates, it creates dialogue and it creates conversation. And, you know, I'm not naive to think that they're going to be like, okay, that makes complete sense. Let's add 10 bucks to everything. Um, you know, that, that's not going to happen, but it starts with healthy dialogue and that can be very, very challenging, but, you know, there's very large entities out there. And I know the networks, for example, I know they're communicating with insurance partners and, you know, the <clears throat> shops need to communicate. It's a, it's a, you know, it, it, it's a flow, you know, the, the, the networks hear from their, their members, their franchisees, their licensees, and they, then that needs to be communicated to insurance partners. Um, there's industry forums, whether it's CCIF, whether it's um, regional forums, the SARS of the world, the ARAs of the world, the MMDAs of the world. These are, these are entities that I know are engaging in dialogue and I wish I had a silver bullet, but we all know that that silver bullet currently does not exist. But to, to put a bow on it, it has to be constructive dialogue and it has to be continue, continual dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember sitting in a room and people saying, what's industry doing? What's industry doing about this? And I kind of looked around and said, well, your industry, what are you doing? Right. And, you know, some people were like, well, I'm doing this. But other people were like, 
I shouldn't complain. I'm not really doing anything about it. So, um, yeah. And it's, and it's, it, it, it's hard to be positive. Um, but it's one thing, you know, we try to lead all of our performance group meetings, our training classes, when people are introducing themselves, we say, what do you like about this industry? Cause it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. It's all not all negative. There's a lot of positive things occurring in this industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and let's leverage that and, you know, let's, let's continue with constructive dialogue. That's, that's, and not giving up at the end of the day. Yeah. And like you said, it's not, we're not naive to think that it's going to be one conversation and everything's fixed. It's just going to, it's a long time that, that it's going to be a journey to get things back to um, where we want them to be. But uh, education is the first step. And, and, it's and how do we, how do we move a mountain? We start with a bag of rocks. So everyone pick up a bag of rocks and let's start going. Yeah, it's easy to start getting angry when you hear the words compensation isn't fair. So let's try to remain grounded and educate. But I I get mad about it too. So, <laughs> all right. So um, Daryl O'Keefe says, John mentioned volume versus profitability as possible things to focus on. But which would you focus on first? It may seem obvious, but maybe not for everyone. So volume versus profitability, which is the most important to people? Well, again, it's situational. I mean, there's obviously, I mean, consolidation is a concept that is based on volume, um, you know, higher volume, lower margin. Whereas someone who's a little more specialized will not, maybe they don't have the um, desire to, to grow. They don't have the equity to grow. So they're going to focus on margin. So it's, it's really situational. What is your situation? What is your overarching plan? Um, what's your access to work? Are you in a large metro area or are you in a smaller town? Um, so it's very, very situational. But at the end of the day, whichever one is your overarching strategy, you, you have to have a constant eye on both, obviously. Um, they're hand in hand. But if, but if you are chasing um, margin, then your strategy becomes focused on that, but you do need an element of volume, but what's that volume? Um, you know, we do exercises with shops that, you know, pick a, pick a number out of the sky. Like what's your optimal sales number? Uh, and they pick a number. Well, how'd you, and my first question is how'd you come up with that number? Well, you know, and then as soon as there's that hesitation, it was just a number that would be awesome if I could do this, but, but we get very involved with shops on planning, you know, based on your current overhead, your current profit level, what is your sales number? Like, how much do you want to make? Like you need to, you need to ask yourself those questions. What do I want to accomplish? What do I want to make? Um, and that, what do I want to make number is very different in a, in a, in a volume um, environment versus a margin environment. And without a, you can't have a plan without a goal, basically, is what we're saying. Bingo. Yeah. And what's the goal? The goal has to be thought out and, and realistic. Can't just be more money. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. What, what is more money? A exactly. dollar is more money. So mm-hmm. is a million dollars. Exactly. There's many gritty details to these, like we've been talking about. So if you want to take them, rewatch the session tomorrow and we send it out in our easy and take all your notes of all your plans you need to make and uh, all the challenges and you guys can make a plan. But um We'll also tell you at the end where you can learn from more information from Max and Nobel and how they can help you. But I've got a question from Rob Bentley. I think this is one for Brad. Uh, how do you hold people accountable who refuse to be? Get buy-in on the plan. That's what he said. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think I know where that's going. I mean, I see it all the time where guys are, it's not my fault. I didn't do it. How do you hold them accountable for their actions? I, I run into this all the time. Every time I'm visiting a body shop, it seems like just about the, one of the biggest and probably since I've been in the trade, which is actually kind of scary, pinholes and scratches, whose responsibility is this? Mm-hmm. And it's, it seems like a constant war in the shop, which to me, I don't know if I'm just because I'm on the outside looking in, it's such an easy, simple solution that I don't understand why it's a, a but God, that's one of the reasons it comes up when I talked about repriming and re, rework in the shop. Who fixes the pinholes? Well, my answer is who put them there? That's who fixes them. If I, if I get a run in a car, I got to fix it. Mm-hmm. If you know, as a painter, if I, if I don't match the color, I got to fix it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's, again, we get into the team, team environment. If you put it there, fix it, own up your responsibility, teamwork, any, any team, hockey team, baseball team, 
everybody for that team to be successful has to leave their egos at the door mm -hmm. and realize that this is a team. Be yeah. responsible for your own actions and your own mistakes. It's, it's still, everybody screws up. Yeah, just admit it. <laughs> yeah, and you, it's not going to stop. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and if you can't get over admitting it, admitting it, then perhaps this isn't the place for you. you yeah, and I think it's just I think it prevent it just communication. I think again is is have your text and that's involve your text in the repair process. That helps a lot, mm -hmm. and, and just so they that they feel comfortable opening up to their co-workers or yeah. talking to co-workers yeah john shoemaker says here good body work does not have pinholes body work should be finished 150 180 grid to allow the paint to chop to feather block prime and block thanks john <laughs> for your insight i agree <laughs> <laughs> got the experts talking here <laughs> but overall it's that peer to, to brad's point it's that peer-to-peer -peer accountability like when you're building a plan and you're deciding what to hold people accountable to if they're part of the process and they agree, I agree to be held accountable to this, then when you hold them accountable, they've got no, they, they agreed to it. They were part of the plan. They, right. So it's, it's, it's that peer to peer accountability and involving your people in the plan. Um, so that when you hold them accountable, it's not foreign and it's not a bad word. Accountability is not a bad word. It's positive. High performers crave accountability. I always say. It's a learning opportunity a lot of the times too, right? Mm -hmm. Why did this happen? Let's fix it. Treat each step of the process as the end use customer. Don't pass something you would not pass on to the customer, to the next person in the line. That's what John Shoemaker says. Agreed. Exactly. Respect for your teammates. Exactly. Yeah, it's just exactly. Less conflict on the shop floor too, if the painter's pass not passing you a messed up job <laughs> or vice versa. Um, Megan says, not a question, but an observation. Based on what I witness as a technician, both the body as well as the paint trades are becoming increasingly complicated. I don't know if there's a skill shortage as much as of a lack of incentive. Keep in mind as much as the material cost increase, so does the technician's tools. So Brad, what are your thoughts there, John, as well? Do you see some of the same thing? So I know there's a big there's a big generalization with today's generation that they're gonna be lazy, but the, every generation says something about the one after them. So I'm not sure if it's just the pandemic of weight on people, but I don't know. What are you observing in the shops? Do you think there's a lack of incentive? I, I don't think it's incentive. I, I I really I think for me, I mean maybe this is selfish on my part, but I think training keeps the interest up too. You gotta the technicians really need to be well trained. Mm -hmm. and keeps their interest up if they're not having mistakes be able to avoid mistakes then they're going to move on they're going to they're going to enjoy their job mm -hmm. um now that we're just getting back i mean for two years almost two full years we didn't have in-person training which is difficult on a technician there were changes there were technologies product changes you name it during that time and it was it's difficult to get out and do in-shop training and when we get back to the you know, or do that online. It's pretty hard to show someone how to paint a car on a, on a computer or over a screen. So getting back in person, getting trained, seeing, working with them in the shop is, is crucial, really important on, on our part. A well-trained technician, I think you can avoid all those hassles and keep the interest up too. It's going to get more and more OEMs are, the OEM training is going to become very important in the very near future. That's so we were talking earlier about global trends. That's going to be one of them. Learning specific for BMW, learning specific for Mercedes, for Honda. They're all going to have their own programs. It's 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 on its way. Yeah, that's I've been hearing that for a few years as well since I joined the industry. I've been hearing that uh, left, right, and center. So it's coming. Um, Rob Bentley says, high performers crave accountability. I'm going to use that one. I like it. <laughs> all right, it's so free. that's <laughs> we need the quote credit for john all right um so that puts us on the hour uh thank you so much both to brad and john for that conversation uh we got a lot covered in this last hour and it's always a, ple a pleasure talking to you too so thank you thank you thank you all right yeah. until next time everyone else uh stay tuned to collision repair mag and we'll have another open dialogue for you soon uh thanks everyone have a great day be sure to thank check you. out axon nobel if you want more information on how you can make your plan Got John and Brad. Uh, I'm sure they're willing to talk to you if you reach out to them. So, uh, of course. Sure. everyone, have a great day. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.